G'day legends, today I want to share with you some of the things that I wish I had learned early on when I started mixing. Things that when I finally found out how to do them, I wish I'd known them all along. Some of these things you're probably already going to know, but if you're fairly new to mixing, some of these may be new to you. Now the first one I'm going to talk about is mix bus compression. Now it might seem kind of dumb, but when I first started playing around with mixing, this is probably back around like 2007 so just doing like demos at home I just finished school and I had no idea what I was doing and for a really long time I didn't use any compression on the actual mix bus and when I finally did it was this like massive revelation I remember working on this like pop punk track I had some guys come in and record a song with me and I kind of remember why I tried it but I put the Waves SSLG comp on the mix bus. I must have read it in a forum somewhere or something and I had a couple of Waves plugins that I hadn't really used yet and as soon as I did it, it was just like, what the heck, this sounds amazing. There was so much more punch, the mix was glued together, it was more exciting and it was just a real revelation moment for me to be like, wow, mix bus compression is a thing. And back then, you know, we didn't have as many videos on YouTube, you know, back in the dinosaur days. Like, YouTube was like a baby back then. There was a couple of videos, but you didn't have all the content you have now where you can just go and learn anything. So it might be like kind of a dumb one. You might look at that and be like, yeah, I already know about that. Maybe for someone who's pretty fresh, this might be news to you too, putting a compressor on the mix bus. So let me quickly show you here, you know, the power of this. This isn't the Waves G-Comp here, and you know, if you're like me, you've got a soft spot for that compressor because of, you know, everyone's used it. Like, it's just a, a staple plugin, but you know, now there's so many variations of SSL compressors, and this is one of them, the Slate FG Grey. Now, have a listen to what this is adding to the mix. We've got a fairly slow attack, an auto release, a couple of dBs of gain reduction, two to one ratio, and it sounds like this. Breaking bones and skipping stones on the sea. So that's a nice gluey setting, but what if we take it off auto and we put on a faster release? What can this add to our mix? Breaking bones and skipping stones on the how much excitement that adds so obviously varying settings create varying effects and having a setting like that a slower attack with a faster release gives us that excitement and energy which is one of those things that you always wonder like how did they get so much excitement and energy into their mix and this is one of the ways you can do it all right the next thing that i want to talk about another one most of you might know about but it's parallel compression now we all know that we can duplicate a signal compress one a lot harder and then blend it in and get that kind of dry and wet signal blended for that parallel compression effect. And obviously the biggest place this is used is in drums to give us those big larger than life drums. And so when I discovered parallel compression, it was just such an eye opening moment for me. Like this is how we get drums to sound massive. So for example, in this track, I've got the kick, snare, the toms, and then a little bit of overheads and rooms being sent to my parallel compression send. And we're just using like a VCA style compressor. And it sounds like this. And then I'm blending that signal in with my actual drum mix. So it gives it extra energy. And then once you discover that and you start playing around with different compressors, different attack and release times, you can really start to shape your drums in powerful ways. Having a slower attack with a faster release is gonna give you a lot more transient and punch and excitement. Whereas if you just have a fast attack, fast release, you're gonna crush the transient and just add a lot of sustain to the sound. So let me show you what that sounds like. Now, if I was gonna go for that kind of effect, I'd probably go with an 1176 fast attack fast release, maybe a four to one ratio. And let's crush this a little bit. So real crunchy, adding a lot of sustain to the sound. And let's hear what that sounds like in the mix.
It's crazy. So just an amazing tool for getting big, powerful drums. You can use this with anything. You can use it with guitars, vocals, pianos, whatever. Anything that you want to add a larger than life sound to using parallel compression is a great way of doing it and also maintaining the original signal as well. Finding that sweet spot between natural and compressed. It's not just compression, it adds saturation, it adds color, can add distortion. It's, it's an amazing tool. So another thing that really changed the way I mixed was when I learned how to do groups. So when I started playing around with audio and mixing, this wasn't really something that came to mind. I didn't have anyone to show me what to do. And I'm self-taught, so I pretty much have learned everything that I know just by trial and error, stuff online, going into studios, learning off other people. And so using groups wasn't something that I came across straight away. But once I had seen that kind of process, like putting all of the drums into a group, and then you can process the drum bus and putting all of your guitars into a group, you can control the volume of all the guitars with one fader. You can put two mics onto a send and process that rather than trying to process two individual mics or blending them down into one and processing that, you can do it on a send. So there's lots of great ways of using groups and sends to process sounds. And it's just a really powerful technique to start using and get the hang of. It also makes for great session organization. You can see I've got all my drums in a group up here. Got the bass tracks in a group, guitar tracks more guitar tracks, so on and so forth. And it means that when you bring it down into its simplest form, your mix can end up being just a couple of stems. You've got drums, bass, guitars, drums, lead guitars, glockenspiel, vocals, backing vocals, you know? Coming from having over 70 tracks here, we now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're down to eight kind of stems that control the whole mix. So it is really powerful being able to group sounds together and just have control over your mix in a simpler way. Now, another really important thing that kind of took my mixes to the next level was when I really started focusing on reference tracks. Now, referencing isn't always super important, but it is something that will challenge you to improve your mixes. So especially when you're kind of starting out and you're trying to get a hang of mixing, comparing your mixes to a professional mix is really eye-opening because you'll listen to yours, you'll listen to theirs, and you'll just be like, why does mine not sound like that? And it will force you to think harder, to try harder, to achieve sounds like you hear in those records that you really love the sound of. So I had a couple of records and references that I would kind of always come back to to try and achieve these big sounds. And one of those was Paramore. I was just like obsessed with the sound of the Paramore records. And I was just always trying to get that really big sound. And it always just pushed me really hard to try and achieve better sounds because I'd listen to their mix and I'd listen to mine and it just was like, it's just missing something, you know, like the excitement's not there. How can I get my mix more exciting? And so referencing is just a really good way of trying to improve your critical listening, as well as then trying to figure out how to improve your mixes to take them to the next level. I do have other thoughts on referencing, but we might save that for another video. Now you've heard me talk about this one a lot, but phase, understanding phase. When I started recording, like I said, I, I started out on my own, no one teaching me anything, trial and error. I just remember thinking for a long time, like, how come when I put the snare bottom mic in or the snare top mic, it sounds so crap? Like, why is it so thin? Phase. So thankfully, you guys have endless resources. You get to know this stuff really quickly. But for me, when I first recorded drums, I was just like, why did these sound so crap? Like, <laughs> these don't sound like drums on the records I like. These drums sound boring and they sound weird and they sound muddy or like why is the snare disappearing when I turn the overheads up there's so many things with phase and mixing drums that have to be addressed to achieve a really good drum mix and for the longest time I just couldn't figure it out and it just seems really dumb now but when I finally learned about phase it was just like this enlightening moment and I just could not believe for how long I had not known about this and yet I still managed to push my way through it and still get some cool sounding mixes. But then I was just like, these could have been so much better. And so if you don't know about phase and phase aligning drums, I'll put a link in the description below. You can go check out a video where I show you how I like to phase align my drums. It's super important. Really got to learn that stuff. And phase doesn't just affect drum. It affects any sound where you have multiple mics. Say if you've got two mics on an acoustic guitar that aren't distanced properly, set up incorrectly, you try and blend them together you're going to get phase cancellation, maybe filter combing. That stuff sounds terrible. Same with mics on amps. You've got two mics on an amp. One might be a little bit further back than the other. Some people do this intentionally to kind of like 
create a different sound, get rid of a bit of fizz out of guitars. But if you don't do this properly, again, you just get filter combing, weird sounds. It sounds terrible. If I had an example, I'd show you, but um, everything in this session is phase aligned. Maybe I can just quickly show you on a guitar what it sounds like if we take it out of phase. Okay, see these two guitar mics here? See how the waveforms match up nicely? So they're in phase. Let's say this mic was further back from the amp. So it's gonna hit this one first and then this one. Let's hear what this sounds like now that I've pushed it out of phase. So you can hear the difference. It's just weird when it's out of phase. Like there's frequencies that are scooped out and missing and that's what filter combing sounds like. So understanding phase is incredibly important and massively game changing to achieving better mixes. So the next thing, another kind of like, probably seems dumb and obvious, but using effects sense. So if you've been doing this for a while, some of this stuff's like, yeah, this is no brainer. But when you're starting out, I'm sure that you probably, when you started dabbling with effects sense, you're like, oh, this is really cool. And it can save a lot of CPU. If you are putting a reverb on every single one of your vocals, that stacks up and you can start chewing into your CPU quite a bit. And if you don't have a very powerful machine, can start slowing things down, you start getting overloads, it can be kind of annoying. So by having a send off of your vocal or just a single send off of your vocal bus, because now you've learned how to do groups, you can just send it straight from your vocal bus to a reverb, and then you've got reverb for all of your vocals. And if you're not trying to do a different sounding reverb on different vocals, then that's great. That's such a simple way of doing it. But say you wanted different reverbs for your harmonies and you wanted a different reverb for your lead vocal, you could have a send off your lead to a type of reverb and then you could have a send off of all of your harmonies to a type of reverb. That's still only gonna be two types of reverb as opposed to say if you had 20 vocal tracks, two reverbs instead of 20 reverbs. So it's gonna save a lot of CPU power. So many good things you do with sends, reverb, delay, you can add like stereo effects, like on vocals, you can send them to micro shift and get some nice sort of like chorusy width going. You can have parallel compression, you use that on your drums. You can have parallel distortion. You can send your vocals in and just saturate them and then blend that in a little bit. Using sends is very powerful. So for example, here on the vocals, we've got all the vocals being sent to one send and on that it has micro shift. And that is being blended in with our vocal. So let's have a listen to what micro shift sounds like. Making bones and skipping stones on the sea. So we're getting this cool, chorusy wide sound and I'm just blending that in with the lead vocal and because this track doesn't have any double tracks this is helping create kind of that double track effect and I don't even have to duplicate the vocal track I've just made a send and put this effect on it. Breaking bones and skipping stones on the sea. Like for example here doing a fro delay. Diving into the D. All right that's enough about sends. They're good. Definitely use them. Now something a lot of new mixes struggle with is compression. Just like the understanding of compression, what compression sounds like, what different attack and release times do. And once you crack that code, man, it's crazy. Compression adds so much color and tone to your sound, to your mixes. It's such a big part of mixing. Like EQ and compression are our two biggest tools in mixing. Once you get to understand that a slower attack on a compressor lets through the transient, lets through the punch of the sound, and then a fast release will bring everything to the front of the mix, you can start to understand that you're gonna get a really forward punchy sound by having a setting like that. Slow attack, fast release, classic 1176 setting for an upfront vocal. Young days when we became the lion, the hunter with the golden mane. But let's say we slow the compressor down. What's gonna happen now? Oh, in the young days when we became the lion, the hunter with the golden mane. It's not as aggressive sounding. It's not as saturated sounding either. Like in 1176, it gives us a little bit of tone and color, a little bit of like light saturation distortion. And that's a wanted effect. It adds thickness, it adds color, it adds tone. It's not like a nasty overdrive distortion. It's, it's subtle, it's nice, it's appealing. But having a slower release, brings out less of that effect and it makes the vocal sit a little less forward in the mix. Let's have a listen to it with everything around it. Oh, in the young days when we became the lion, the hunter with the golden mane. Okay, it's like it's still forward, like it's a loud vocal, but it's, it's nice, it's smooth sounding. Let's listen to it with the fast release. Oh, in the young days when we became the lion, the hunter with the golden mane. So we get 
kind of different tones. We get a bit of a smoother sound with the slower release, and we get a bit of an edgier, more aggressive sound with the fast release. What if we have a fast attack, fast release? Oh, in the young days when we became the lion, the hunter with the golden mane. It's just pinning the vocal. It's just sitting in place, keeping it right at the front of the mix. It actually sounds pretty good. What if we slow the release down with a fast attack? Oh, in the young days when we became the lion, the hunter with the golden mane. Makes it sound a little bit more dynamic. It's still grabbing it, but it's just like easing it off gently. Doesn't sound like so pinned in place. Different ratios create different tones. Listen to how much brighter it sounds on a 12 to run ratio. Let's go back to our Dr. Pepper setting, three and five. So the higher the ratio, the crisper the sound is. And you know, every compressor is a little different. I'm just showing you one here, the 1176. And this is a compressor that everyone loves and uses. So it's a good example. But that's the thing with compression. It's a Swiss army knife. You can create so many different sounds, but it's just starting to understand what these different parameters mean. And that can take a while to develop an ear for and an understanding of how to use compression. But one of the things I've heard someone say is that they think of the release knob as like, you know, a forward and a backwards kind of thing. Like if you have a fast release, it's going to be forward in the mix and in your face. If you have a slow release, it's going to sit further back in the mix. And I agree with that. It does have that effect. When you have a slower release on a sound, it's a bit gentler. You can sit in the mix a little bit more. Fast release is going to bring it to the forefront and be more exciting. And so when you get that understanding of compression, you can really start to use this tool to shape your mixes powerfully. Another really important thing is understanding masking. So a lot of mixes, when I hear an issue with a mix, it's generally masking. So we've done a lot of like viewer mix reviews to get sent in. And a lot of time, the things that I pick up on are, you know, this sound is hiding this sound, or, you know, there's the vocal sound muddy because this, there's too much of this frequency in the guitars. So once we can kind of understand and start to pick that stuff apart, we can really clean our mixes up because frequencies tend to build up across the mix in certain places, especially depending on the arrangement and what sounds you use. Sometimes it's a lot worse because a lot of the sounds are fighting for the same region and you have to figure out how to separate these things out to create enough space for everything to work nicely in the mix. Okay, let's say that I had boosted a bunch of 800 hertz into these guitars. I really like the sound of that on the guitar. I think it makes the guitar sound nice and stand out. Have a listen to what it does to the vocal though. It clutters it. It clutters the vocal, it clutters the mix. Sure, maybe on its own that sounds kind of nice, but in the context of the mix, it clouds it. And being able to identify that is a really big skill to have. So critical listening, learning how to find problem frequencies. If you feel like I can't hear this, but it's loud, like I've got my vocal loud, why can't I hear it? It's probably the fact that there's some frequencies building up that are fighting for the same area and just making it hidden. So understanding masking and how to deal with it, absolute game changer. Now this one, this is probably a, a more recent one for me actually. And it's, it's not doing anything it's actually just leaving a sound alone and knowing when it sounds good enough to not need any processing. We typically start mixing and we're just boom, boom, we're chucking stuff in, let's start EQing this, let's chuck a compressor on. Sometimes we don't need to. Sometimes a sound is great as it is. And that is a really hard thing to figure out, but it's a really good skill to know when to not process something. So that's for all the veterans out there who are, who are like me, who've been doing this for a long time, knowing when to not do anything, maybe just the fader, maybe just some panning and fading and that's all I needed. And I've been doing that a lot lately and actually been really happy with a lot of the results when I'm able to identify, hey, this sounds really good. I don't need to really EQ this at all. I don't need to compress this much. Knowing that is a great skill. You know, like every video we watch, it's like, oh, add saturation, add parallel compression. You need like three reverbs. You need a delay on this. Sometimes things are great, without doing anything. And I'll give you one more. It's using drum samples. I'm not the biggest fan on reverb on drums, like in the right setting, like, yeah, like you can love getting that big, massive drums in a hall kind of sound, stuff like that. 
but typical just kind of like i'm just going to put a bit of reverb on my snare i i find that using a room sample of a snare is way more appealing and realistic to me than applying a reverb to a snare drum obviously it depends on like the mix and what you're chasing like if it's a big ballad reverb then yeah for sure but if you're chasing more of like a natural sound taking your real drums blending in a snare sample of a room can just give you the life that you were missing. And it's not even like you've replaced the drums and you know, you're know you a cheat because you can't mix properly. It's, it's basically like using a reverb, but you're triggering the sound of a room instead. For example, in this song, I did replace the kick because the kick mic was not recorded properly. You can hear the bass drum is just sort of just all boom. So I've just replaced it with one of my drum samples. You know, it sounds like someone hitting a pillow or something. It's terrible. So that's when using a replacement can be really handy. For example, you know, you might have a small setup and you don't have enough channels to do a snare bottom mic. Well then you could trigger a snare bottom sample. Yeah, just adds the life back to the snare. So a great way of using samples to fix a problem. And then underneath this, I've got a snare sample to add the crack of the snare back in. And then we've got a snare room sample to add the space. Let's take all our samples out. You hear how when I take the top mic out, we lost something, we lost the body. And that's what that's adding. That's adding like the fullness of the snare. The samples are enhancing it. That's how I'd go about using samples. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you want to support this channel, check out the description link below. Go check out my drum samples. I got a bunch of stuff up on my website, bunch of sample packs, mixing courses. Go check that out. It's a massive support for the time that goes into making these videos. And if you need some new awesome plugins, check out the affiliate links below. And if you buy a gear online at Sweetwater, consider using my affiliate link below. Using that link doesn't cost you anything extra, but a small commission of what you buy gets sent back to this channel. And that helps support the time that goes into making videos. If you like the sound of the track that we're having a look at in this video, then check out this next video where I'm going to show you how to mix it from start to finish. Oh, in the young days when we